All right, our uh, next speaker is Dr. Kit Lowe. He uh, is an assistant professor at Harvard Medical School. He is also the associate director of the motility services at the Boston VA, and he will be speaking to us about esophageal testing, pH impedance, I think another very relevant uh, topic uh, in the whole esophageal function realm. All right, well, thanks very much to the organizers for inviting me to give this talk. Um, it is a topic that I'm very excited to talk about. Um, and uh, over the next um, 20 minutes or so, we're going to be talking um, about impedance pH testing. I'm gonna go over some of the indications for testing uh, our approach to doing these tests as well as some advice on how to interpret these tests, which I think is uh, the most important part um, of this uh, sort of test thing. So our terminology, just to uh, give everybody a sense of the entire name, it is called multi-channel intraluminal impedance MPH, which we often abbreviate as MIIPH because it is quite a mouthful. Um, and we distinguish it from pH-only tests uh, because uh, pH-only testing does not include impedance sensors, which are needed to detect bolus or non-acid reflux episodes. Uh, and this is the um, tool that we use to perform impedance pH testing, which is a transnasal catheter. Um, you can see here, it is a long catheter that we insert through the nose. Um, it goes into the esophagus, um, and the tip extends often into the stomach. And there are two general types of sensors um, arranged throughout the catheter. The first type are pH sensors, and there's usually one in the distal esophagus, which is positioned five centimeters above the LES, as well as a second pH sensor in the proximal esophagus. Some catheters will also include a third pH sensor um, in the stomach uh, to give a gastric baseline pH. And the second type of sensor is the impedance sensors. These are closely spaced, and they're clustered in the distal esophagus in the proximal esophagus. As you can see on the diagram, there's usually about four in the distal esophagus and two in the proximal esophagus um, at the um, location specified from the LES. There are also some specialty catheters. Uh, more recently, um, there's been a development of the hypopharyngeal catheter, which also includes a third grouping of sensors at the upper esophageal sphincter um, and we're using that these days to evaluate patients with pharyngopharyngeal reflux or LPR. These are some images of the wireless recording device that goes along with the catheters. Um, and uh, what we do is after the catheters are placed, we give patients uh, these devices, which they must keep around them in proximity um, to receive all of the data from the catheter. Um, in addition, there are buttons on these devices um, for the patient to self-report um, both their position, which will uh, let us know whether the patient is in an upright position or a supine position. We also ask the patient to record all meal times, which must be excluded from analysis. And there are some assignable buttons for the patient to report their symptoms so that we can do some symptom association. Um, we often, as a backup, also ask the patient to keep a paper diary of their symptoms and of their positions just so that we have a backup in case there is anything going on with the receiver itself. The main indications for pH impedance testing um, are to further assess patients with persistent GERD symptoms, especially if the endoscopy is unrevealing. Um, we also use it to monitor the adequacy of PPI treatment in patients who have persistent symptoms despite medication use. Um, more importantly, we use it to evaluate patients before anti-reflux surgery and other endoscopic reflux procedures to make sure we're selecting the right patients to respond uh, to these procedures and treat their reflux. Um, and finally, we do use it in the peri-lung transplant evaluation process to help identify candidates that may benefit from anti-reflux surgery soon after transplantation. One of the Big controversies in pH impedance testing is whether to do the procedure off or on PPI. Um, and every year we have our Harvard Motility course and we ask our audience this question and every year we get a different answer. I believe two years ago it was split evenly 50-50. But I think one good uh, guideline to use is that um, you know, we recommend doing the test off PPI for at least seven days whenever we're thinking about doing anti-reflux surgery or anti-reflux procedures. So 
for preoperative evaluation, we do recommend off PPI testing um, to look for patients who may uh, uh, be best uh, responsive to anti-reflex procedures. And this is also the approach that we would take in patients who have a low pretest, probably a reflux. Anyone who we're concerned may have more functional symptoms, um, we would recommend doing the test off PPI. For patients who have um, a high pretest, probably of reflux, where you know, they may have other findings on other tests, such as esophagitis on endoscopy or Barrett's esophagus, we may advocate for these patients to be tested on a double dose PPI. Um, this will also help to answer the question of whether the PPI treatment is effective in patients who may have breakthrough symptoms despite PPI treatment. Um, in association with this test, um, patients often also undergo esophageal manometry, um, which is helpful to evaluate the location of the LES and make sure that the pH and penis catheter is placed properly. Again, the distal pH sensor should be about five centimeters above the LES and the esophageal manometry can help identify the location of the LES in a less invasive way. And as we uh, mentioned briefly before, after catheter placement and patient reporting, the receiver is returned for data analysis. And depending on the institution, this may include either returning to the hospital um, for the catheter to be removed and for the unit to be returned, or in some cases, um, such as at the VA, we provide a, uh, a, a postal box that the patient can return all of the components back to us uh, in. So here's the sort of most important part of this discussion um, is how do we interpret these tests? So this is an example of a trace thing. We've zoomed in on a um, 10 to 20 minute interval here. And um, uh, basically these graphs um, show all of the information um, that have been reported um, in an organized manner. At the top, we have symptoms and meals, which were self-reported by the patient. Next, we have the proximal pH sensor. Next, we have all the impedance sensors throughout the body, um, both the proximal impedance sensors and the distal impedance sensors. And then finally, we have the distal pH sensor. And what we're looking for are decreases in impedance at the sensor, because this indicates some passage of bolus material through that portion of the esophagus. And um, specifically, when we see that there is a drop in impedance moving from the distal esophagus to the proximal esophagus, that would indicate the presence of a reflux episode. So if we were to interpret this particular um, part of this tracing, um, again, this is the symptoms and meals on top. And what we're seeing here is that there's a decrease in impedance from the distal esophagus to the proximal esophagus. Um, we can also see here that the pH in the distal esophagus at this point is between four and seven. So this is weakly acidic bolus. And finally, the patient has indicated the presence of regurgitation symptoms. That's this white dotted line here. And so what this represents is a regurgitation episode that's associated with weakly acidic reflux. The nice thing about impedance testing is that we can also do um, some uh, computer overlays to help us visualize this information better. So this is essentially the same tracing, but what we've done is overlaid the impedance data um, with this violet colored um, overlay. And we're still seeing here the drop in impedance um, from distal esophagus to proximal esophagus, which is representative of a reflux episode. We can actually see here visually that the uh, violet color is sort of the reflux episode itself. This is a pH between four and seven, so this is weakly acidic, as this designated by the distal pH catheter, uh, sorry, the distal pH uh, sensor. And then there is also the uh, patient's symptom report of regurgitation here. So this is regurgitation associated with a weakly acidic reflux episode. And it is very important that even though um, the software uh, of the pH impedance um, uh, machine will pick out these uh, reflux episodes for you, um, we always want to go back and look through the entire tracing because it's not always accurate. Um, we want to look through um, both for uh, episodes that are marked by the uh, 
software has reflex episodes to make sure it's marked properly. And we also want to look at the areas that are not marked to look for any reflex episodes that may have been missed. Again, the software is pretty good um, in terms of excluding the meal times, um, but there is uh, a, a very important um, uh, role that we have as uh, interpreters of, an of manometry to make sure that the computer is uh, doing its job properly. So what constitutes a positive test? So we have um, a lot of previous data, mostly off PPI data, um, looking at uh, different uh, thresholds for what would be considered abnormal acid or bolus reflux. And we wanna use this data to help guide us in terms of determining you know, which patients have true acid reflux um, and which patients might benefit from further treatments. So the acid reflux data includes acid exposure time, which is the total percent time where there is uh, an acid reflux exposure in the esophagus. Uh, which is divided by the total time of the uh, test. Um, and we also know about the Gneister score, which is a composite score, um, including a lot of these acid reflux components, um, also to help determine uh, whether patients would respond well to anti-reflux surgery. Fortunately, with impedance testing, we also get bolus reflux data, which can be helpful uh, to determine the bolus reflux or the bolus exposure time in the esophagus which may also help suggest um, the presence of um, bolus uh, reflux that could be causing um, symptoms for our patients. Um, and of course, the bolus reflux data also allows us to look at the number of total reflux episodes and then separate them also into acid reflux and non-acid reflux episodes, um, which is um, better than when we just use pH testing without impedance, which only gives us acid reflux episodes. Again, in order to determine the presence of non-acid reflux, which may be contributing to reflux symptoms. And finally, symptom association is very important. Um, again, recall that the patient is telling us what experiencing these symptoms. And we have a few ways of looking at whether or not their symptoms are associated with um, uh, reflux episodes. So we have both the symptom index, which is basically just saying um, if the patient has a symptom, is it associated with reflux in sort of a, a very basic um, uh, um, division type of uh, calculation. And the slightly more complicated symptom association probability, which really calculates a 95% probability, almost like a p-value in terms of whether a symptom is actually associated with acid or non-acid reflux episodes. More recently, there have been developed some novel metrics using the pH impedance data, um, again, to further determine whether or not a patient has pathologic reflux. Um, so we have uh, a metric called the MMBI, or mean nocturnal baseline impedance. Um, and this metric reflects the esophageal permeability, which may be due to reflux injury. And the way this is calculated is by averaging the impedance values of three 10-minute periods while sleeping um, taken one hour apart. When we take this value, um, we look at low values less than the threshold of the 2,292 uh, ohms. And the thought is that low values predict response to PPI and increased reflex severity as reflective of uh, increased esophageal permeability and worsened esophageal injury due to reflux. A second novel metric that's been used more recently is the PSPW index. Uh, this stands for post-reflux swallow-induced peristaltic wave. This reflects the integrity of the primary peristalsis stimulated by reflux episodes for chemical clearance. And the PSPW, the wave itself, is defined by an anti-grade progression of a 50% decline in impedance within 30 seconds of a reflux episode. So basically, in a normal person, what we want to see is when there's a reflux episode, there should be some sort of clearance mechanism right afterward um, for chemical clearance of this reflux. And when that doesn't happen, that's a problem. So the PSPW index, we actually take the number of reflux episodes followed by PSPW. So that's when you know, the, the appropriate uh, chemical clearance following reflux episode divided by the total number of reflux episodes. And then there's a low index less than 0.25 or less than 25% uh, of the time that suggests an impairment of this chemical clearance and uh, relating to increased reflux severity. That may also be a way to look at for patients with pathologic reflux. Um, so a couple of years ago, um, uh, a group of motility um, colleagues came together 
Um, these are really the leaders in our field um, to talk about how we take all of this data together, all these different metrics, and how can we diagnose drug with greater accuracy using pH impedance and other tests. And what they came up with was the consensus criteria for interpretation of pH and pH impedance testing. And the goal here really was to show that if we combine pH impedance in combination with endoscopy and manometry findings, we may be better able to establish a diagnosis of GERD. And the thought is that one conclusive or um, the presence of at least one adjunctive evidence um, in borderline cases may be, um, may be diagnostic. So here they've taken the acid exposure times and really stretched them to their limits. So you know they're saying with conclusive evidence, that's when we see acid exposure times greater than 6%, that's quite high. For sort of borderline cases where the acid exposure is between four and six, we're not sure. And so that's where some of these adjunctive data might come into play with symptom association, with the number of reflux episodes, with these novel metrics such as MNBI or PSPW index, may all be contributing to help us diagnose GERD. Um, and finally, when the acid exposure is low and less than 4%, that's fairly um, uh, good evidence against pathologic reflux. And so when we include the endoscopy data and the manometry data, endoscopy contributing information about esophagitis, Barrett's esophagus, or complications of reflux such as strictures or other findings, that further supports a diagnosis of reflux. Um, whereas with manometry, if there's evidence of a hiatal hernia, if there's evidence of um, hypotensive um, esophageal uh, junction, or with a diagnosis of hypomotility on the manometry testing, those may provide some supportive or adjunctive evidence in borderline cases. So thank you very much, and uh, we'll see you at the question and answer session.